$300 for the all-in pledge of The Witcher. That's with shipping. How can we justify that much money for a board game? Any board game. I'm Chris Steele, and this is Tabletop Game Talk, a show where we talk about tabletop gaming topics of all kinds. Today, let's justify cost, if we can. Uh, the idea behind this subject was to help explain to our friends and family why it's not crazy to spend this much money on a board game. And I wanted to back this up with research. So that's what I did. This episode, it'll be short, um, but it'll be research-filled. Research-filled. So let's first look at the cheap entertainment shall we um streaming streaming is cheap um netflix netflix is nine dollars a month but still half my friends who have adult jobs and you too you have an adult job you're still using your parents netflix password that's it's not necessary it's nine nine dollars but anyway um for eighteen dollars you can get something bonus i didn't look into this it's, it's some kind of range from nine to eighteen dollars uh disney plus you can get, well, Hulu for $14, no ads for $20. You can get live TV, throw in, you know, $73. But you also get Disney Plus and ESPN and all those cool things. Um, HBO, got to be able to watch, well, it used to be Game of Thrones and then that got bad. Um, I'm sure there's something on HBO to watch these days, right? Uh, it's between $10 and $15. So depending on what you have, if you just have one of these at the lowest cost, you're looking at a quarter an hour if you watch 10 hours of TV a week. You're probably watching it with more than one person. You're probably watching more than 10 hours. You don't need to watch more than 10 hours. A few hours a week is just fine. But if you are at the high end, um, you're probably looking at, you know, two and a half, three dollars an hour for entertainment. Again, if you're watching 10 hours total, again, if you watch more people, this this is cheap. It's super cheap. Um, this is a better value than board games. Not gonna lie to you about that. I just wanna sit down on the couch and, and watch TV, you can do that. Um, you also don't even need to get a streaming service. Watch YouTube. I will say, though, YouTube without the ads, infinitely better. Professional no. So, if we're not watching streaming, what are we doing? I wanted something a little bit more engaging than streaming. And, well, you're still staring at the TV, so let's just go to the next logical thing, and that's video games. Um, this is Monster Hunter Rise. It's the newest Monster Hunter game. This is the deluxe version. Cost $70. This is the last game I bought, and I did a Google, and the internet's told me that 20 hours is how long it takes the average person to complete the main storyline, and 60 hours if you want to add all the extra content in there. Um, I played for four hours and got really bored. Video games are boring to me, which is, well, it's not, I guess it's not ironic. I just, I spent 20 years of my life designing and writing video games and I'm bored with them. But if you're not bored with them, you can actually make a pretty good return on your investment with this because most people aren't spending $70 on Monster Hunter. In fact, you could have got it for $40 at one point I saw. And at that rate, you're making just you know a couple dollars an hour of entertainment to play these. And if you do completionist, again, internet says, to do a completionist run of Monster Hunter Rise, it's going to be about 130 hours or so. So that's a really good return on your investment. It's also a long time to play one video game. So video games still aren't that social. Yes, Monster Hunter Rise has a multiplayer mode, but for the most part, you're playing it solo. And I wanted to get an idea. I was like, okay, what is it going to cost to get a group of people together and do an activity together? And even though we haven't been able to do this because pandemic, um, eventually we will. And apparently the average cost of going to a movie is nine and a quarter per person uh, for the movie ticket. And I don't know where this is at. I live in the Chicago area, so my average ticket price is, I don't know, $13 or something crazy. You're gonna if you're gonna go to the movies, you gotta get some popcorn, some refreshments, and that's gonna run you about twenty bucks. So I figure for two people, average movie is two hours long. You're looking at about ten dollars per hour per person. Not bad. Um, it is one of the more expensive things you can do, especially if you're doing concessions and especially if you're going to you know, you know release night type of things. Also, really, they're gonna come back. We're gonna have movies. I 
I'm certain that by the holiday season, we'll have a new movie in the theater. I'm really looking forward to it. Um, but when you do get home from a movie, that's it. The movie's over. You watch the movie. That's great. Um, you have popcorn. You have leftover stale popcorn, usually, is, is how our house works. But still not that tactile feeling, right? You're, you're still just absorbing entertainment. And unless you went out to dinner, you really weren't even socializing. So... Maybe this isn't the best comparison, even though it tends to be the go-to for a lot of people. And I wasn't getting the numbers I needed to justify a $300 board game that I'm likely going to play once. So I went to the extremes on the other side here. Um, I'm like, what can I do that's interactive, that has a very, very high price per hour? And for some reason, my mind went to... Jumping out of an airplane. Yeah, skydiving. Um, you know, jumping out of an airplane can run anywhere from, you know, $150 to $200 even. This is low end. It takes about two minutes to jump out of an airplane and hit the ground. Um, hopefully a little bit longer and hopefully you're landing, not hitting the ground. But it's, it's you know, a small portion of time. So I figured I would get to multiply the numbers and my swag number came to $4,500 per hour per person. And I think this is a good reason why people should play board games instead of jumping out of airplanes. There's probably other reasons not to jump out of airplanes. Um, I get it's probably not a fair comparison, but it did lead me down thinking, maybe I'm in the right ballpark here. Maybe sporting events is a better comparison to what you can do with a board game. Because I have an investment in a board game and now I can use that investment to perform this activity. And I'm not a sporting event person, and I don't know why skydiving made me think of skiing, but it did. I thought of skiing. And the average equipment cost, good, for the internets, is about $700 to get, you know, your skis, your, he has goggles, and he has a helmet, and he has gloves, and his ski thingies, and apparently you're not supposed to wear jeans when you're skiing. I saw that on the internet, too. The internet's an interesting place. That you should check it out sometime. Um, now... How often you use it is going to be based on your return. I have an average time here of one hour because if I spent $700 on skiing equipment, I would go once. I would be out there for an hour. I'd be like, this is terrible. Where's the bar? And then I would try to sell my skiing equipment to, to pay for the bar tab. Um, I don't like going outside. I'm, that's why I do board games. I'm literally in the basement of my house recording a YouTube video about justifying the cost of board games. Why would I ski? No reason. Um, so let's get to the board game part of, part of this. Back to The Witcher. We don't have to go all in. We don't have to spend $300. We could just buy the base game. And if we do it on Kickstarter, we get a whole bunch of extra stuff with the base game. And the base game is not $300. The base game's only $85. If I play it once with two friends and it takes about two hours to play, that's only $14 per hour per person. I can justify that. That's reasonable. If I play it four times, it's $3.5 per hour per person. This is okay to do. In fact, I highly recommend that people try to not go all in on Kickstarters. But I'm not going to recommend that with The Witcher because why would you not go all in? There's more stuff. That's a problem. That's a problem. That's my problem. Trying to justify it to the world, to you. Justifying. There's more stuff. Get more stuff. I have justified this. Actually, if you watch my Marvel United video, I justify why I backed Marvel United twice. It's Honestly, aftermarket, you can sell it for more than you bought it for. But I'm not I'm not buying this to sell it. I'm not. I'm only buying one copy of this. And let's look at the three hundred dollar pledge. Same same numbers. I, I didn't put this up there because they're more depressing. Um three people for a two hour session, that's averaging fifty dollars per hour per person. Three people, if I play four times, then it's twelve and a half dollars per hour per person, which isn't bad. It's actually not bad. There's a lot worse Kickstarters out there. Um, and this content, I think I would actually use a lot of this content. Uh, the Mages expansion adds, you know, new player characters and a new way to play them. The uh, Legendary Monster expansion adds monsters that move around. Um, and then there's another expansion that is there that has stuff in it. Um, but all of this got me thinking, 
maybe I'm looking at board games wrong. Or maybe you're looking at board games wrong. Because I think I've always sort of looked at board games this way and trying to justify the cost by looking at the entertainment value of a board game really kind of reinforce that that's not what I buy board games for. No, maybe primarily I do, but not only. It's not the only reason I buy board games. It's not only so I can play them. Uh, there are some games that I really enjoy, but if the game isn't pretty, if the game isn't engaging, if the game doesn't like draw me to the table, if it doesn't have a great table presence, I like the game less. Terraforming Mars, I hate that game. I hate it. I hate it in every which way because there is no enjoyment in looking at that board, looking at those cards. There is nothing about that game that pulls me in. The gameplay's okay. It's okay. But how it engages me, it's just, it fails to engage me on a artistic level. I think board games and... Well, if you're still listening after the Terraforming Mars things, thank you. Um, sometimes I go off on tangents. But I think board games should be considered art for the most part. And if a board game has bad art, bad components, bad production, it isn't worth as much. The Witcher is not a... It, it, the Witcher's a good game. By all accounts, every reviewer who's had their hands on it love this game. It's going to be a good game. It doesn't need all the plastic. It doesn't need all the art to be a good game. But the fact that it has the plastic, the art, the components that are fun and engaging to interact with, this is what makes the value of the game worth more. If you just want to play The Witcher and not have any of the components, you can go to Tabletop Simulator and play it. Like it. It's free, right there. Go ahead and play it. It doesn't cost you anything. But if you want that piece of art in your house, it's going to cost more. There are people, I know people, who spend $300 on a painting of a lemon. Is that worth it? I don't know. It's a lemon. On canvas. On your wall. For $300. Sure. The frame of these pictures here, the pictures are probably cheaper than the frame. Frames are like 150 bucks to put a frame around a poster. I, I built a puzzle. I'm like, oh, this is cool. Put the puzzle together. I like this art. Let's go see what it's going to cost to get framed. $90. $90 to put a frame on a puzzle I bought for 10 But people do it. I mean, we frame art all the time. So if we look at our board games and we appreciate the art of the game, the production value of the game, it's a lot easier to justify spending $300 on something. Look at these miniatures. Like, this is just, this is one miniature, and the detail is, it's just so detailed. It's small on your screen, it's bigger on my screen, but it's still detailed. But the art on the card is great. The box cover, you could hang it on your wall. Some people do. Um, probably your gaming room. I wouldn't put it in the living room per se. Um, but it depends. I'm not going to judge you. Metal coins, the feel of like feeling like you're in the world and you have these coins. Like this matters. In fact, The Witcher, the first set of coins that they released, I'm fairly certain. No, this is a different game. There was a game that recently came out with kind of generic coins. And the fans are like, wait. Those are your metal coins. That doesn't, that's not engaged. That's just like those one fives and tens. And that's not interesting. So they went back and redesigned the coins because that's what the fans are looking for. That's what makes us love these games and want to interact with these games. So once I started thinking it that way, I started thinking that my math was wrong. Like, yes, you can measure the value of a game based on the amount of gamer hours, player hours th that go into it. But there's more to it than that. And I want to use Marvel United as an example again, because this is a game that I've recently gotten and I have returned on my investment so far. And I want to I examine how that return on investment has worked out so far. First of all, the game was about $220 all in, again, with shipping. And... That's a fair amount of money still, right? It, especially for a casual game. I've played this game about 16 hours-ish uh, with friends, you know, 
So I've played it probably solo, maybe for eight or nine hours, and then I played it with some friends for a few hours, and so total will uh, say 16 hours. So if I just look at gameplay, we're looking at 13.75 an hour. I would have to play the game a lot more to bring that number down. I'm not going to count the YouTube stuff I've done around it, although I could, because for me that increased the value, um, which would be a few more hours. And I'm not going to count, well, I'm going to count something that I do with a lot of my big box games like this, and that's reorganizing. I spent over a day organizing this game, finding the right way of storing it and being able to put everything in one box. Not the miniatures, but everything else in one box. We'll get to the miniatures in a second. And I did a reboxing video on this because the satisfaction of having everything fit in and boom and put that cover on and like, yes, I have this all in one spot. It's ready to go. It's easy to pull out. It's easy to play. I got a certain satisfaction from that. Now, I am not going to pay somebody $9 an hour to organize their game. That's that's doesn't make sense. But it's worth $9 an hour for the enjoyment I got out of organizing my game. And the best I can equate this, I'm not a car person, I'm not an outside person. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm a computer guy that plays board games. But anyway, some people really enjoy summer Sunday afternoons and washing their car. Because when they get done washing the car, they get to look at it and it's a nice clean car and then they go out for a drive, right? Like, they're not going to pay someone so they can wash someone else's car, but they enjoy the activity of washing their car. They enjoy the activity of taking care of something that they have put money into. By the way, we could talk about justifying car prices too, but I didn't think about that yet, so I don't have a slide. But so organizing this game has given me enjoyment, but that's not where I'm going to stop on this in this game because this game, and I'm calling this potential value because I haven't done it yet, but I do have. I've started. Basically, I plan on painting all this stuff. And the miniatures I've taken out of the box and I put them on a shelf and the shelf is now on my wall and it's a bunch of unpainted miniatures on a display shelf. And I will paint these because they're being displayed. And even if I don't display them, they're still pretty cool looking on that shelf. I figure about an hour and a half per miniature to paint them. And that might be a little bit, I might be able to do it a little faster, do them in bulk. Um, they're chibi miniatures, so they might be a little bit easier to paint because, you know, they, there's not a lot of shading. At least I'm not going to be putting a lot of shading on there. I want them to be, you know, cool looking, but not as cool as the Simon stuff painting, painted miniatures. Those are ridiculous. Um, so I figure, you know, that's an extra 127 and a half hours that I could enjoy with this game without ever playing it again. If I take all of those hours together, I get about a buck and a half an hour of potential entertainment. Now, am I going to do that? I don't know. I don't know that I'm going to paint 85 miniatures or how many ever that was. But I know that the idea of painting them, the idea of putting them on the wall, the idea of displaying them, that's a fun thing for me. And I will paint many of them because I will paint them and be like, hey, I want to play against, I don't know, I'm blanking on this. I'm going to play against the Sinister Six. That's a great example. And I'm going to use these four heroes to go against the Sinister Six. So now I have 10 miniatures. And I'm like, you know something? I'm going to play that scenario. I'm going to play it that I've, I've planned out. But I'm going to paint these miniatures first, and then I'm going to play it. And I'm going to put them on the shelf. And there's going to be a bunch of unpainted miniatures, and then we have these painted miniatures. And it's going to say, hey, I'm going to make the next scenario. And as I pick out these scenarios, I'm going to paint them before I play them, and then I know that I've used them. And then I just get to keep using characters that I haven't used yet until everything's painted. And I could spend a long time doing that and get a lot of value out of one game. Unfortunately, I'm Cult of the New, and their next game is going to show up from on the front porch and Kickstarter somewhere in the next couple days because I usually get a game or two a week because I'm addicted. But I am not the norm, I hope. If you are only backing a couple Kickstarters a year, you can do this. You can make the value happen. And hopefully I've given you some ideas as to how you can make that value happen. And hopefully I've given you some justification of how this hobby equates to other hobbies. Um, yeah, that's all I got. So I'm Chris Steele. This has been Tabletop Game Talk. Like, subscribe.
See you later.